what we do here is go back, 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 back. Hello and welcome to Mr. Toyama's AP World History. Now we're going on to Chapter 6, Early Societies in the Americas and Oceania. First up we have our overview. The cultures of the Americas and Oceania developed in relative isolation to the other early complex societies. Nevertheless, they too developed an agricultural base sufficient to support growing populations, specialized labor, political institutions, diverse societies, and long-distance trading networks. Less is known of these cultures than those of other parts of the world primarily because either writing systems did not develop or written documents perished or were destroyed. The fragments of writing and archaeological findings indicate that these societies were complex and developed rich cultural traditions. For our bullet points we have this. The early societies in the Americas built elaborate ceremonial centers that reflected both a complex religion and powerful political authority, left a rich artistic legacy that included pottery, sculpture, metalwork, and painting, developed sophisticated knowledge of astronomy and mathematics. The early societies of Oceania saw the gradual dissemination of agricultural technology spread by austro uranesian seafarers who traded and settled throughout the Pacific, and formed a well-integrated society known as La Pitia that stretched from New Guinea to Tonga. So here's the area we're going to be talking about, early Mesoamerican societies. You can see this is basically southern Mexico slash uh, Central America and just a little bit of the tip of North, uh, excuse me, South America. And so we have three uh, kind of areas we're going to be looking at. We're going to look at the Olmec, the Mayas, and the Teotihuacan influence around the city of Tenochtitlan. So we're going to go ahead and go on from there. So uh, the origins of Mesoamerican societies. Migration across the Bering Land Bridge with a question mark. Now, uh, if you think on our global map, we have this area known as the Bering Land Bridge. Many uh, archaeologists speculate that at one time during um, a cooling period during our Earth, there probably was a lot more ice that connected what we would consider Siberia or um, northeastern Russia today to what is now known as Alaska. And with that being understood, there might have been this place that we have named the Bering Land Bridge. And this Bering Land Bridge might have been a place where peoples had crossed uh, from the European, Eurasian continent over to the North American side of the globe. Uh, this was probably around 1300 BCE, maybe even earlier, it's 1500. Uh, by sea from Asia is another speculation of how the Mesoamerican societies uh, grew. The reason why we don't really have much understanding of how they arrived in this place is, as we started at the very beginning, we understand that the origins of humans uh, in the class of Homo sapiens comes from the region of uh, Ethiopia today or uh, Central Eastern Africa. And as we spread out from Central Eastern Africa out into Europe, eventually to the uh, to the larger southern sections of Europe, and then continued to spread out to what we would call today India and um, to China, and then we pushed up into Russia, there was an icier area. And we don't know why these people were migrating, probably for food, maybe for civil conflicts, maybe uh, just to continue migration and following herds. But as they got across this land bridge, they eventually moved south to uh, areas where it was warmer in climate and eventually settled down where they were able to farm or to herd animals. Uh, one of the possible ways that uh, the Mesoamerican societies grew is also by sea from Asia. Uh, many islands that uh, have been covered by oceans today or smaller um, groups of peoples may have gotten on boats and traveled for days and weeks and even maybe longer to get over to uh, to the western coast of the United States. Uh, by nine, uh, 9500 BCE they reached the southernmost part of South America so we're talking the very very end of the earth at the very tip and uh, these hunter-gatherer societies were similar to the ones we talked about in chapters previous to this and they evolve eventually into agricultural societies and now as I go forward we're gonna have to kinda understand that this isn't going to be as clearly understood uh, archaeologically or even historically this is our best understanding based on the evidence that is available to us it's it's scarce in the uh, documentation it's scarce in our, our records and archaeology because uh, most of this is from a very long time, even farther back than uh, some of the societies that we studied previously. First up, we have the group called the Olomecs. 
uh, they were around from 1200 to 100 BCE. Olmec means the rubber people in their language. They created uh, areas known as ceremonial centers where uh, w the archaeological evidence we have is that this is where the ruling class lived, where important uh, warriors or small uh, armies would live, and then there would be artisans and other specialized labor that would support those areas. And those ceremonial centers such as San Lorenzo, La Venta, Tres Zapotes, they were basically places where the king or the ruling class would be at the time and we understand that at certain times of the year during ritual holidays people would come into those ritual centers or ceremonial centers and they would celebrate whatever specific holiday it was and then they would leave and return to their villages or for example there were market days we understand that there were markets in these areas and they would come from all over have the market or like kind of like think a swap meet and they would come bring their goods do some trading and then head back to their villages now one of the things that distinguishes the Olmecs very specifically is these things known as the Olomec heads. As you can see on the right hand side I have a picture. These heads were anywhere from 10 feet tall, they weighed tons of pounds, uh, specifically around 20 tons, and uh, I have kind of on the right hand side a, a silhouette of a small child and a an adult kind of leaning near that small child to kind of give you a sense of scale. Uh, we know that the Olomecs did not have many uh, beasts of burden, as they would be called, uh, animals to transport these uh, Olomec heads. So they were carved, more than likely carved, out of the faces uh, or in the in the form of their rulers, probably to denote uh, the significance of the rulers. Think of a statue today we have maybe of George Washington or Abraham Lincoln, and they would um, be transported by dragging or rolling on logs. So the way it would work is... You would cut down logs, you would smooth them so they were round, and then what you would do is you'd maybe get 20 logs or so and you'd have teams of people place the heads um, on the logs and you would create almost like a train track of those logs and you would push the head along the logs and it would roll over top, kind of like wheels, and then when they got to the end of those logs they would have a team that was in charge of moving the back logs to the front and creating more track as it were and they would continue dragging these on. It would take about a thousand workers per head to move them where they needed to go and uh, this was a very labor intensive process for the Olmecs. Now we know a little bit about the Olmecs and their agriculture and their herding. Uh, their staple crop was maize. You may know it today as corn but it's not exactly corn. Maize was a smaller version of corn it is a lot harder. If you think to um, uh, what's called a cornucopia, if you think about Thanksgiving time, there's this like kind of thing that looks like a croissant, and inside of it usually has fruit, if you can picture that for Thanksgiving. Inside of there, there's usually these tiny, maybe five inch long, six inch long pieces of, of almost mini corn, and they were usually brown or red or different kinds of colors. And this was maize. Maize is not the same uh, caloric content. It's also not as soft as uh, what we would understand as corn today. But maize was very nutritious. It can be stored for long periods of time. What they would do oftentimes is ground up or um, create a paste or a small kind of uh, like grain-like substance out of it. And they could bake it into tortillas or some sort of bread. They wouldn't have had a formal tortilla like you would think of. Um, from a Mexican food restaurant, but for sure they would have had something along those lines. For herding, they had turkeys, and they had barkless dogs. Herding turkeys, turkeys are very um, easy to maintain, like chickens. They don't eat a lot of food. You can feed them maize. You can also They also eat bugs for protein, but they're relatively slow. They're flightless birds. They don't fly away, but they also grow very large, and when you when you uh, kill and eat them, the turkey is a very lean protein, giving them lots of calories. Also, barkless dogs. Uh, the barkless dogs, we know, help to herd animals. Dogs have been always very good at, uh, especially domesticated animals like dogs, are good at organizing herds of animals in the way that a shepherd would need them to be herded. So for these barkless dogs, they would be able to go around and kind of nip or bite at the ankles of some of the animals that needed to be kind of corralled together. The dogs were good at um, keeping them all as like a herd. Many uh, pack animals that are for herding are not uh, always the smartest animals. 
and so it's been very good for uh, organizing uh, those animals a and at the same time they both were food uh, they did eat the dogs they did eat the turkeys and um, they didn't have any draft animals or beasts of burden like I talked about before and there were no, no development of wheeled vehicles that we understand like a cart for example this created some other uh, problems but it also gives us some insight into how their society was structured one of the things we understand about the no draft animals thing is that we know that the labor that the people undertook in terms of farming was done by hand and the de non-development of wheeled vehicles means that all transportation was done by uh, human uh, motor power and so there wasn't uh, lots of goods being transported over large uh, distances without the need for humans to actually carry them themselves. Now Olmec society probably authoritarian in nature meaning that the authoritarian would be uh, someone in a society that's organized around one leader who is the absolute authority within that society and they would be almost treated like a god or treated like someone who oversaw large sections of their society. This large class of conscripted laborers to construct ceremonial sites. This conscripted labor, we would not call them slaves, we call them conscripted, meaning that they were from the society, they were uh, able to do other jobs at the time, but uh, during this specific time period when the building projects or whatever labor needed to be done, those people would be conscripted by the uh, king to come to a certain section of the world and work on whatever needed to be worked on for uh, their area. Also, we know there are tombs for rulers, there were temples, they built these stepped pyramids, meaning they have, um, unlike the pyramids in Egypt we're very familiar with, which is just a, a smooth-faced triangle on the outside, these stepped pyramids almost look like steps on the outside of a pyramid, but very large steps that create um, non not very sharp at the edges, but very... Uh, I'll show you a picture a little bit later, and uh, drainage systems that uh, was able to help irrigate crops and remove uh, sitting water from different areas of their society. Now we know there was this weird, mysterious decline of the Olmecs. We know at some point their ceremonial centers were destroyed, uh, but there was no evidence of warfare, so there wasn't evidence of other societies coming in. We do have some problems in trying to figure this out because the only evidence we have is that many of their uh, religious centers, their ceremonial centers were destroyed, many of the religious uh, statues and different uh, things related to the the ceremonial cults were destroyed, defaced, uh, some of the statues were even buried with um, or broken, uh, so we, we speculate that it was either a revolution, possibly a civil war, uh, where there was a giant shift in the society of the Olmecs that uh, either was showing a distrust of the old ways that were set up for the Olmec society or it was a civil war in which there were warring leaders that were vying for uh, leadership or prominence within that society and so we know that the Olmecs declined and we know that the next group to take over pretty much continued on in a lot of ways some of their similar uh, ruling styles and uh, their agricultural techniques that's the Maya now the Maya uh, had huge cities that we discovered in the 19th century, the 1800s, from, and we know that the Maya were around uh, 300 BCE to 900 CE, and their big contribution to, uh, that was different from the Olomecs was, was terrace farming. Now, the hills of the Mayan um, area, they're not really conducive to flat agriculture as you water different crops the water can run down it doesn't seep into the soil it pretty much just kind of slides uh, the crops away so you have to create terraces which are steps into the actual hillside to allow flat zero grade or zero um, tilt to the land so that the water can sit for example when it rains the water sits it doesn't wash away the crops it goes into the soil and soaks the, pl the plants underneath in this terrace farming, they created maize, they grew cotton, uh, which it, they would use for textiles, they uh, grew cocoa beans, or cocoa beans, which they would eventually use for chocolate. If uh, any of you eat chocolate, they come from cocoa beans, if you didn't know that, they're ground up and uh, kind of mixed into a paste and then baked, and that's what creates uh, chocolate. And then they were also used for currency, 
we know that that uh, the cocoa beans was used to for trade and currency and keeping track of uh, who was trading goods for one another. And we know that the Maya had a major ceremonial center at Tikal. Next, we have Maya warfare. Uh, the warfare was for the purposes of capturing enemy soldiers, and they did practice ritual sacrifice of enemies. The Maya were uh, very big on enslavement, and this enslavement process was similar to what we would talk about a little later with Rome. They used their enslaved captives to um, work for them, but also to uh, please their gods. They would have ritual sacrifices of enemies by basically creating bloodletting, uh, by killing different groups of peoples at this time and that would in in theory for their religion uh, appease the gods that they were worshiping uh, small kingdoms engage in constant conflict until chichen itza begins to absorb the captives uh, there was a shift in mayan warfare originally this warfare was 100 percent about capturing enemy soldiers for the purpose of either enslavement for work or ritual sacrifice of enemies but as chichen itza grows as a center a city uh, it creates a larger uh, political sphere around it, and many times uh, these captives who are absorbed would be allowed to live their lives cons uh, with the one requirement that they actually converted over to the Mayan religion, converted over to the M Mayan way of life, and, and accepted Mayan dominance over their lives. Some uh, Mayan captives we know did uh, choose instead to die as warriors, uh, and this creates the center of an empire, this Ma this Chichen Itza, that becomes the center of the empire for the Mayan, that almost parallels or or seems similar to that of uh, larger sections of the globe that we looked at before in Europe and parts of Africa. There was a Mayan ritual calendar. It created complex math during this time. They also invented the number zero. Uh, this number zero was something that was very difficult for many uh, cultures to understand at the time, but uh, the zero helps in a lot of ways to uh, create larger number of counting processes. So, for example, uh, conceptually zero is a complicated idea because you, how do you represent nothing as a something? Y you get the idea there philosophically. But their invention of zero helps them to understand how to uh, do math in terms of understanding a, a year. Their calendar is the first calendar to be 365 days. They calculate it as 365.242 days. They eventually would be found to only be 17 seconds off from what we would understand today. They used two calendars that ran concurrently over top of each other. So, for example, their solar calendar was 365 days, while their ritual calendar of holidays and festivals ran for 260 days. The management of calendar lends authority to the priesthood. So, in similar ways to uh, the ancient Hebrews, the priestly class that understood how the ritual holidays were and the calendar itself were able to give um, credence or authority to the priestly class to tell the people when it was time to harvest, when it was time to plant, when it was time to stop working and celebrate a festival, when it was time to sacrifice more people to appease the gods, and this creates a um, overlapping problem, or an overlapping interesting point, I would say, and it creates auspicious moments for agriculture. The, the priests would actually sit around and try and figure out how uh, this cycle that came around, it, it took about 50 years or so for them to link back up to a similar day. They would try and figure out what do we exactly do on this day based on the two calendars that ran over top of each other. What exactly does one do on, say, the 50th day of the year. What does that look like? Because if it's the 50th day of the year, according to the solar calendar, the ritual calendar might be still in the last year or even into the next year. So it just depends on what the priest would tell you. And this led the priests to gain a lot of influence and power within that society. Now, the Maya language and religion. We talked about ideographs in the Chinese uh, unit, and they also had a syllable uh, alphabet with sounds, uh, like a, ah, u, e, a, ah, like the syllables that we would like, apple, 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 two syllables, right? Uh, most writings were destroyed by the Spanish conquerors in an attempt to uh, Christianize a lot of their area, but we found some of their uh, language and religion, and the deciphering work began in the mid 1960s. Uh, Popol Vuh is the Maya creation myth. Uh, basically, the Popol Vuh goes like this. 
the Mayans believe there were two uh, people originally. The woman who bears all the children, or let me find her exact name to recount to you. Uh, she who has born children, and he who has begotten sons. And these two uh, first peoples eventually grow through the use of maize uh, and water, the first peoples. The maize creates their skin and flesh and body, and the water it uh, transforms into their blood. And this shows a kind of uh, connection between the people, the land, the agriculture that they're growing. Uh, and this is kind of a creation myth that parallels a lot of other creation myths that we understand that the peoples started with a man, a woman, uh, that the gods or the first peoples eventually created those later peoples that are you or I today by doing some sort of uh, combination thereof between goods like the maize and some other natural elements like water and mixing them together to make the first peoples. The agricultural cycle maintained in exchange for honors and sacrifices. Uh, the The idea was that the gods up there were creating, were allowing the natural uh, order of winter, spring, summer, fall to keep going on, and the crops to grow and all that. In exchange, that they are honored and sacrificed to, and they would have blood letting rituals. Uh, many of the Mayans used those captured soldiers or captured groups of peoples and. Uh, killed them through bloodletting rituals in an effort to appease the gods but even in some instances we have an example of kings Mayan kings uh, allowing themselves to be bloodletted for the purposes of pleasing the gods human sacrifices follow after the removal of fingers and piercing uh, to allow blood flow this was less about the actual taking of the life of the person but more about the flowing of the blood in the creation myth there is this sense that water and the land are are kind of used together to make people and in in a lot of ways the blood that runs through your veins is much about the the water that is connected to the water that creates life for plants and in the same way that your flesh is destroyed for the purposes of pleasing the gods that the maze that was made of your flesh is destroyed to keep your body growing and, and continuing. So these bloodletting rituals, as you can understand, uh, parallel a lot of other religions we uh, that we will study as the year goes on. Now, the Mayans had this weird, almost kind of similar to what we would understand today as soccer, called the Maya ball game. It was a ritual game. And there were high-ranking captives, a prison of war. They were contestants. Sometimes they were done uh, just for sport and entertainment. The way the game would work is that the uh, Mayans would take a uh, hardened rubber ball, heated rubber ball, a solid ball, and this thing was very heavy rubber in its pure state with no um, air sac in the middle like a soccer ball is a very dense object. It could easily lead to concussions if you get hit in the head with a solid rubber ball. Think about a um, bouncy rubber ball that you bounce on the ground. Those aren't pure rubber, but uh, think how how solid and hard those rubber ball balls aren't balls are now imagine a 20 to 30 pound uh, rubber ball the size of about a basketball flying at your head and it could easily knock you unconscious give you a concussion and it was anywhere between two to four maybe even higher numbers of people competing and the way it would work is they were to use their their feet their hips their torso their head to move the ball either through a set of rings or to uh, put it within a certain section of the land. And it's similar in a lot of ways to soccer that we understand today. And the uh, contest usually had dire consequences. Sometimes they led to the execution of losers. So if, uh, for example, I and another teacher were competing against you and one of your friends, that would uh, take us some time. We'd play the game try and get some points and hopefully by the end you've scored more points than I have scored and if you had scored more points with your team than I had with my team we would be the ones who would be immediately executed sometimes they even have found uh, records of uh, the heads of the losers stacked along the sides of this uh, of this playing area 
and this was kind of a way to denote that the gods were pleased through this process and also to show you kind of a preview of what happens if you if you lose this was another part of that bloodletting ritual for the gods allowing uh, certain captives and different peoples the opportunity to be successful at uh, saving themselves from uh, execution here is the city of oh this is always one of my worst words uh teotictlan teotictlan the city of Teotlan has one of those step pyramids I talked about before. As you can see, it's not exactly the same as those of the Egyptian pyramids in its very uh, stepped sides or steeped sides, uh, but it is similar in the sense that it is a pyramid with a pointed top and a uh, multi-sided uh, face. The highlands of Mexico is where the city of Teotlan lives or is. Uh, the lakes in the area of high elevation, so many of the people who were archaeologists studying this believe that many of the original uh, inhabitants of Teotihuacan led themselves there or were led there by the the lakes that provided fresh water the village of Teotihuacan in five begins in 500 BCE and expands to a large agricultural city it becomes an important cultural center uh, there's a, a kind of weird thing that happens in archaeology we don't have a ton of evidence of what exactly happened in Teotihuacan because their books were all destroyed or didn't exist at the time we do have evidence of their carvings we do have evidence of some of their extensive trade network because we've been able to find goods that are from Teotihuacan and have spread around the areas uh to southern america uh but we also know the influence surrounding areas as there were carvings that kind of spread out and similar uh symbols and different things that we found carved into stone and it begins to decline around 650 CE and it's sacked in the middle of the 8th century and burned we're not a hundred percent sure again why the, this is and we have no real understanding of what they really believed in or what they uh, valued but we know that there were um, certain aspects about their society that we can gather from the archaeological evidence Next, we're going to move down to even farther into South America, known as the Andean Societies. They're around 12,000 12, BC, excuse me, and the climate improves around 8,000 BCE, and meaning that it got warmer. It creates um, better opportunities for uh, agriculture to develop. They're largely independent from Mesoamerica. They weren't really um, interacting that much with uh, what we would call southern Mexico and Central America today. The Andes Mountains kind of creates a little bit of a barrier and a buffer for that. And it was highly individualized due to geography. Uh, the Andes Mountains, again, create kind of a separation. And it's it's really far south from uh, Tecnoclan and uh, some of the Maya and Olmec societies, as we studied a little bit before. In the... Um, Andes area, we know that there was this thing called the Shavin cult. This new religion is in the central Andes. It shows up around 900 to 300 BCE. Little is known about the particulars of the religion. Uh, we don't really understand it exactly. We don't even have evidence of what its true name was. We just know that it, its the city was named Shavin de Huantar. And we know that they were very focused on art. And so well, some of the evidence of that is that there's elaborate weavings, <clears throat> elaborate stone carvings, they made pottery. Uh, the cults may have arisen when maize became an important crop and as a response they were uh, interacting more heavily with the the land itself and using maize as, as something that they maybe even worshipped. During this early Andean society became increasingly complex. We know that they um, kind of launch during this time from being very simple in their terms of their pottery and their carvings in terms of their society as a whole and moving into larger scale groups that are um, creating more intricate and developed uh, artistic and art artisanal works. Next we have the Mocha state. It's in the valley of the Mocha River. It dominated northern Peru between 300 and 700 CE. Uh, very little is known about them other than some of the paintings uh, that survives. Uh, we see, for example, uh, people, aristocrats embarking on a hunting party, warriors leading captives bound by ropes, women working in textile factories under the eyes of a supervisor, rulers receiving messengers or ambassadors, and beggars looking for handouts on a busy street. Uh, we don't have... Uh, any writing from the Mocha state, but we do have some evidence of um, complex society with 
specialization of labor, as we talked about before. As society develops, you need to have specialized labor of people who are not just focused solely on creating food, but people who are focused on creating other goods as a society might need, and even other services such as religious uh, or uh, priestly class that is providing other types of services to the people. It's one of the many states in the region, and none are able to consolidate into an empire. Uh, this is similar to some stuff that we studied before, where these societies, in some instances, are able to create them for themselves an empire with a larger uh, political sphere that dominates through the use of bureaucracy or through the use of um, tributary centers, which allows the central leader to be worshipped or supported through taxes. The Mochia state does not do that. And like many states in the region, none are able to consolidate into a larger empire. And uh, we're not 100% sure, again, why that is the case. We just know that uh, by the end of the first millennium CE, around uh, 900, 700, somewhere in there, that most of the Mocha and other Andean societies just simply disappear. Next, we're going to kind of jump over to what's known as Oceania. Oceania is the area kind of like southern Indonesia, a uh, lot of Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, uh, most of Australia, New Zealand for sure, so and Polynesia slash Hawaii. So when we talk about Oceania from here on out, we're going to talk about, uh, I want you to just kind of think Australia, New Zealand, and Polynesia, and a lot of the south, very far southeastern Asia. Um, in Oceania, we know that there were prehistoric land bridges that led to these uh, different islands, and those land bridges eventually washed away through uh, ocean currents and tides. Probably volcanic activity led the islands, uh, or excuse me, led the land to be formed, and then as ocean currents wore away at the rocks, those uh, land bridges eventually disappeared, creating islands. And at this time, we know there were lower seas because of the colder climate, and this was allowing uh, more, better migration to those uh, smaller islands. We also know there were outrigger canoes for open sea travel. Outrigger canoes are larger canoes that have kind of a stabilizing arm on the side of those canoes. This led to open sea travel. If you do it right, you can go very far with a canoe and using ocean currents. Early hunter-gatherer societies are in Australia, meaning that they're following some of the similar patterns that we saw in early uh, Central East Africa in the very beginning when we were studying Homo sapiens, and early agriculture is in New Guinea. Here is an aborigine of the Naomi tribe. Uh, Aborigines are some of the natives, as we would call them, from that area of the globe. In his hand, you can see him holding a boomerang. Uh, this is around 1900. So the boomerang, for example, it was a hunting tool. What's great about the boomerang is the very heavy, solid piece of wood. If you throw the boomerang correctly, you can get the boomerang to go out. It can kind of spin for a while in the air, and at a certain point it actually turns around and comes back to you, and you could catch it. Now, the way you would want, hopefully, to do it is not to throw it and have it come back, but you would want to throw it and hopefully have it uh, kind of concuss or hurt an animal either in a tree or um, a land animal and then you could get close enough to stab or capture and beat the animal to death and that would create more food for you and finally we have lapita peoples they're found throughout the pacific islands uh, they were really into agriculture and animal herding and they created a political organization based on chiefdoms uh, their trade over open ocean declines around 500 bce and they have greater independence of settlements. These settlements were kind of led by the chief of that local area or that local village, and each of the chiefs pretty much were recognized as the sole leader and not part of a larger network of an empire or a larger kingdom system. So, we made it to the end. When you have finished studying this chapter, you should be able to do the following. I want you to compare and contrast the development of early Mesoamerican societies. We talked about mm, three-ish in that Mesoamerican area. Identify the key features of early American society and religious beliefs. What made their religion different and special and unique from other uh, religions we've studied in the past? I want you to outline the development and regional importance of Teotihuacan. Why was it developed where it was? And what is the regional importance to the larger area? Next, discuss the emergence and development of early Andean societies, more to the south, what we just kind of talked about a minute ago. And finally, compare and contrast the development of early Oceania societies. Writing assignment. Write a short response, five days sentences, and the following questions using specific examples from the textbook, and be prepared to discuss them in class. Number one, 
Consider the meaning of bloodletting and human sacrifice in the Mesoamericans. How do these practices make sense in the context of their belief systems? How did the societies evolve to support these beliefs and these practices? What sorts of practices evolved out of different belief systems in other parts of the world? So the first part of the question is asking, why is it that human bloodletting and human sacrifice was so integral to the belief system of the Mesoamericans? And if you look back to the... Uh, the story that we talked about before of uh, the creation myth, you're going to be able to kind of start to put together some of the things I talked about before of why bloodletting uh, and the body being destroyed as a part of their religious system that connects back to maize and to water. And finally, how what sorts of practices evolved out of different belief systems in other parts of the world? So what did religions or certain belief systems create to support their uh, belief systems. For example, today, Christianity believes as a part of its um, belief system that uh, human beings can talk to God or to the saints or to Jesus or to someone in heaven. And as you talk to that person in heaven, they hear your pleas and they might persuade God to do something about your problems. Say you pray to Jesus and he will help your grandma stop being sick, for example. Uh, so how did those uh, practices evolve out of a different belief system in other parts of the world? Number two, how did the geography of the Americas and Oceania contribute to the unique development? So what did the geography of the Americas and Oceania affect uh, the development of the peoples that ended up there? What are the similarities in the patterns of development in spite of the geographical differences? How did those groups that we talked about in this lecture all have similarities, yet uh, they lived thousands of miles apart? And finally, the paucity or scarcity or limited availability of written documents for these cultures makes for large gaps in our understanding of them. What sorts of information can we attain about cultures such as these without written texts, and what will we never know? So if you look back, uh, you're going to see a lot of times in chapter 6 in our textbook that there's going to say, uh, in nevertheless, or in spite of the lack of information, we still are able to understand the cultures that we just studied uh, for X, Y, and Z reason. What are the X, Y, and Z reasons? What are some of the evidence that archaeologists are using? There's a hint there to uh, figure out what these people were like, and what are some of the things we can never actually know? That'd be great if you could bullet point those for me. As always, it's been great talking to you. It's now time for you to reread, to refigure out what is in our textbook. Uh, I hope to talk to you all soon. Uh, happy reading. Bye. What we do here is go back, 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 back.